So let's summarize where we left off. So we said for any function f in AC0, we have two senses in which we can approximate it by a low degree polynomial over the real numbers. The first sense is the Fourier approximation, which is um, numerically very close, but only over the uniform distribution. We don't really have a good notion of Fourier expansion over an arbitrary k-wise independent distribution and whether that would be the same and whether it obeys random restriction. So on, the uni on uniform inputs, we know this is very good approximation, but maybe all the places that it differs are exactly those where they are, that are in the support of the k-wise independent distribution that we're trying to compare things to. So, um, so it's not clear how we're going to use this to get from the bridge f on the random distribution to f on the k-wise independent distribution. So our goal is to show that the expectation of f on the random distribution uh, isn't much larger than the expectation on the k-wise independent distribution. I'm just going to prove one inequality. Of course, we can apply the same reasoning to not f to, to, to get the other inequality. Okay. So this suffices to, to show that the difference isn't large. Okay, so, um, so, so this is a good numerical approximation, but may not apply to one of our two distributions. The other sense is we have a probabilistic construction that works point by point. So with the appropriate choices of randomness, we can get it to work both on the uniform distribution and on the k-wise independent distribution. The problem is that when it doesn't work, it's really, really bad. It, we have no control over it. Okay? So, um, so we need to like, combine these two ways of approximating into one that avoids the flaws of the, both the flaws. Um, so, um, so um, one of, oh, and I should say, here's the, here's the bound we had on the degree for the first approximation from the lineal Munzer and Nissan paper, and here's the update from people in the audience. And then during the break, here, here was the degree of the, uh, the uh, Rosbrough-Smolensky-like approximation from the Braverman paper, but here's the update from people in the audience <laughs> that I found out during the break. And it's very similar by Harsha and Srinivasan. Okay. In that we, the dependence on the, on the size stays the same and probably up to this factor of two is tight, but the, the dependence on the, the approximation has moved over, is, is just linear. So, or just one logarithmic. Okay. So I'm not sure whether this, this one is going to be, improve things fairly dramatically. I haven't, I just found this out, <laughs> newsflash. So um, I haven't really incorporated this into calculations. Um, okay. Um, so any questions about where we, we were? Okay. So um, a real clever idea from Braverman's paper is that um, we can tell it's actually fairly simple, the complexity of saying when we might have made a mistake in this second approximation. Okay. Because we have this criteria for, for what, we're, you know, what we're doing the union bound over. It's all sources of possible error. So what, what could go wrong? is we'd have some gate G that's an OR gate that's actually true, but when we do the approximation, we, get some, we don't get the right value. In other words, every set, subset of the inputs that we picked doesn't intersect the, the ones in the input in exactly one place. Now, you can just write down there are either zero inputs or two inputs that are, that are one, okay. two distinct inputs. Both of those are AC0 type formulas. And you can do this OR over all gates in AC0, 
both of these like add depth one to the formula and multiply the formula by some polynomial. Pull off the size by a polynomial. So we end up with a, um, a formula for, for this error function, you know, sort of watch function, guardian function, um, that uh, has size polynomial in S and the parameter T. So, so basically S since T was like polylog. And, um, and depth um, just a constant more than what we started with. So, um, so in fact, uh, we're not actually going to apply the Fourier approximation to the original function. We're going to apply it to this error function, this guardian function. Um, so, um, so when you look in terms of this guardian function, then you have like the place where the guardian is true. Okay, the, the, you know, look at where F, capital F is zero, then goes over to F equals one. We're just lining them up to make them contiguous. Okay. Then the place where E could be true, little f follows the curve, except for this interval where little f can be almost, can be like huge or hugely negative. And then uh, it goes back and follows the curve again. Okay, so we want to approximate f by the well-behaved part of f. So I'm going to call that L is not E, where the error doesn't happen, and f is true. And now I'm going to write L in a really kind of bizarre way. It's logically equivalent, but um, it's not clear why I'm doing this, <laughs> except that it's going to be a good way. Once I've done that, I'm going to like replace certain functions by their approximations, and then it'll sort of make sense. Okay. Um, so saying, okay, not E and F is the same as one minus E times F. E is Boolean, so E squared is E. So I can write this as one minus E squared. What's the advantage of doing that? Well, no real difference if E is Boolean, but when I replace it with a real valued function, now I'm guaranteeing that this quantity is, is bounded by one. Um, so similarly, I'm going to write f as not not f, 1 minus 1 minus f, but then I'm going to square the 1 minus f. 1 minus f is also Boolean, so squaring doesn't matter, but, um, but again, this, when I replace this with a, a real approximation, um, I'm going to, to be sure that I'm less than 1. Okay. So, um, here I claim that I can actually apply the real approximation here. Why is that? Well, either E is zero, in which case there's no difference between these two, or E is one, in which case whatever I've written here is irrelevant because I'm multiplying by zero. Okay, so now I'll compare that to, so now to so this is just this function. I haven't actually changed it. I've just written it in a kind of bizarre way. Okay. But now I'm going to like make a real valued function that's in some sense an approximation. And I've already replaced f by its approximation little f. Um, and what I'm going to do is replace e by its Fourier approximation e tilde. Okay. So um, a few facts about, about L and L tilde and how they relate to the original function. Remember that L is between F minus, is just F and not E, so it's bigger than F minus E, and it's at most F. On the a little more subtle, um, claim that L tilde is at most F plus E. Why is that true? Again, we'll have a, like a case analysis. Either E equals zero, there's no error, and F equals big F, which means L tilde is some function that's, you know, something quantity that's less than one times F. This, one, this not not becomes F again. And that's always less than or equal to F. So um, otherwise, 
um, equals 1. And you note that we set up L tilde to be certainly less than 1. No, um, yeah, but, um, no, the second term is, little f is Boolean, right? No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. So I'm going to just change it okay, and add plus e squared minus e tilde squared times this quantity. So now, um, hopefully, hopefully I got this right. Um, so, so if E equals 1, then this is just L tilde, uh, and this is adding something positive. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, this isn't how, bro uh, how Michael did it, <laughs> but let's see if it works. is not negative, right? I mean, it could be negative. That's the problem. But then, how did we get the inequality in the e equal to zero case? Oh, if e equals zero, um, then f equals capital F. Okay. Okay. And. Oh, you've got the one minus, you've got an epsilon squared f that you can play with that you didn't use before. 
there was a one minus uh, epsilon tilde, sorry, e tilde squared f that is, um, you know, on the right hand side, if you look at the case one second line, yeah. uh, you have that uh, on the right hand board in the green, you have this minus uh, e tilde squared f that you didn't use before, but now that'll cancel the e tilde. This will be. Th that'll cancel the negative e tilde. Oh, actually, yeah. Maybe I, did I do it the wrong way? Maybe it's right. Actually. Exactly so okay. How about if I put in absolute value here? <laughs> Actually, yeah. I'll put in absolute value there. And then that should be fine. Yeah. So the policy that Mark is using is that whenever, uh, whenever F, capital F equals zero, zero then small f. Yeah. Okay. So I was. Oh, I see. So there's also that, is it? Yeah. Whenever, whenever capital F equals zero, but I wanted this to be less than or equal to one. Uh, if this was, if the, both of these are, if F is one, but both of these are very negative, then I could be in trouble. Okay. So, but um, so if uh, if e equals one, uh, if e equals zero, this is this is true, and this is positive. Um, Uh, if E is one, then this is this term is just the absolute value of this. So it's it's bounded, it's lower bounded by its absolute value. I'm I'm improvising, I hope this works. <laughs> so let's see. Okay. This was this ugly part was not in Mark's paper. <laughs> so Okay. Okay, so then the random distribution because L is just F when E doesn't happen this is at most L on the random distribution um, plus E on the random distribution Just like add and subtract uh, L tilde okay. um, and what's L minus L tilde? Okay. Um, it's this with an E versus this with an E tilde. So if we like subtract off, we get some, this, we get an upper bound of this 
absolute value. Which is why I thought it was safe to. <coughs> and the second part is like 2f plus f squared. Actually, 2f minus f squared, but uh, we're going to like take absolute values on the random. The expectation of that on the random, on the uniform distribution. Okay. Plus, now, L tilde on the random distribution is the same as L tilde. Sorry, I can't do this because this is going to end up on the on the KYs. It's the same form as the error term I already had, but now it's going to be on the KYs independent distribution. Let me give another go at it. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, so I just did the neg negated, negated <laughs> trick earlier. Okay. So we get one minus, so this is the negation of this square doesn't change it, negation. Um, and uh, again, when I replace the capital F by little f, if E is 1, if E is 0, there's no difference. If E is 1, there's no difference because this is 0. So, okay. Now, if I replace the E by its approximation, 
now since I'm just having one term, which is of the form one minus something squared, this is definitely less than or equal to one. So, um, so, so L tilde is, so if e equals zero, okay, uh, capital, little, little f equals capital F, and this is L tilde, e is just f. It's the negation of the negation of little, of little f, which is the negation, negation of capital F. If e equals one, then this disappears. Oh, sorry, e t if e equals one, then um, then l tilde is less than or equal to one is less than or equal to f plus c. So why is it less than or equal to one? Because I now have it of the form one minus something squared instead of the product of two things like that. <laughs> and so there can't be anything wrong <laughs> if, if you just subtract them, square from one, you never get more than one. <laughs> okay. So uh, if e equals zero, L tilde is not necessarily f, but if f was zero, then L tilde is zero. Well, no, it's so if e equals zero, yeah. little f equals capital F. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and e equals zero. Oh, 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 I see. So this is saying, this is capital F. Um, so if f, if f is zero and e is zero, then they're equal. Well, okay. If f, if e, f equals zero, then yes, then this equals zero. Otherwise, we just use it L, L tilde is less than or equal to one, which is the most f, f plus one. Okay. Now let's try this argument again. Okay. Why is f plus e at least one? Sorry? Why is f plus e at least one? Oh, because you the. We're assuming that yeah. it's not true that e and, and f are both zero. So since they're Boolean, one of them is at least one. Okay. And this is true over any kind of input, so in particular over both distributions in that. Okay. So, um, so we can, so now let's look at what happens to L minus L tilde. Well, both are one minus something squared. Um, So the difference, the ones cancel, is the difference between the squares is going to be the sum and the difference. So, um, We get something that the sum is going to be something like order e plus e tilde plus sorry Thank 
difference is going to be uh, the difference f times the difference between these two. So so um, okay. This the sum times uh, the absolute value of f times the difference is going to be like on the order of f times e, the difference between these two. Um, plus L tilde of rand. Oh, wait, you also erased by the edge. There's an E of rand that you, you dropped. Yeah. On the first, on that second line. You, you erased like an E rand after the plus on the second line? The last plus. Okay. Nope. You don't have to erase all that. Uh, oh, plus. Yeah, E rand there. Plus E rand. That's all. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. E rand is this delta. Okay. So we have like delta plus the expectation of. 2 plus e plus e tilde times f squared times e minus e tilde plus the expectation of l, l tilde on rent. Um, this we can again like write as put a plus a e and put an e minus e tilde. So when we break it up, the absolute value here is bounded by 4 times the f squared times e, e minus uh, the expectation of the absolute value of e minus e tilde. So this is at like most 4 times the maximum value of f squared times the expected value of e minus e tilde. And then the other term, e minus e tilde, times e minus e tilde, we have an f squared um, times that expectation. So this is going to be delta plus m squared plus order m squared times square root of epsilon because remember that the, the we had the difference between um, the value of e and this expectation is the most uh, an absolute value is the most ep epsilon and it's, it's square root of epsilon. What is m? And the, sorry? What is m? M is the maximum value of f. Okay. So I should have written this as f. Okay. So, and then plus L tilde of rand. So these things are kind of under control. What's L tilde of Rand? Um, here's where we use that KY's independence exactly preserves the, the, um, the, uh, the value of low degree polynomials. L tilde is a, is a polynomial of degree roughly the degree of E plus the degree of F squared, double. So as long as we make k large enough compared to those two, uh, okay. And what do we know about L tilde? We know L tilde is at most f plus e over any distribution. So this is the most delta plus order m squared square root of e plus uh, f of k n plus e of k n. And we also know e of k n only happens with probability delta.
So now we know that the function, on, the function on the random distribution isn't far off from the function on the k-wise independent distribution. So, um, okay. um, so the one thing now is to like calculate how big k has to be. So the main thing here is you know we want this to be about our final gamma over some constant. So delta can be like order the gamma that we want at the end. But epsilon has to be um, has to be like gamma times m to the negative, or gamma squared times m to the negative 4. Okay. And m was s to the d2. D2, saying we're you know picking delta to be about gamma, D2 was log S over delta to the to the order D. So um, so if we were using the the original bound as as Braverman did, um, then um, uh, so epsilon has to be something like uh, s to the negative, you know, s to the, it's going to be like uh, expo exponential in s to the uh, to, to the it's going to be exponential in log s to the order d. Which means that the d1 is going to have this log of s over epsilon. That's going to be, uh, forget the s, but the log of the 1 over epsilon is going to be like log s to the d. And so d1 is going to be log s to the order d squared. is our k, right? So, d, okay, our k is going to be d1 times d2 double, it's going to be 2 d1 d2, because uh, we multiply them and then square. But the most, d1 is going to be the most significant factor. Okay. So, um, so our k is going to be uh, yeah, order d1, d2, which is going to be like log uh, s to the order of the square. Isn't it just the sum? Yeah, d1. Yeah, d1. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's just the sum. OK, so the, then the, <laughs> but times 2, yeah. <laughs> So um, the D1 is going to become pretty much irrelevant. <coughs> Even if we multiplied them, the D1 would be pretty much irrelevant. This one is going to be pretty significant, okay? Because we need to pick epsilon much smaller than this one in M. And we need to pick an M is growing proportionally to D2, you know, exponentially with D2. So this one is going to, D1 is going to be the one. Did I say D2? I think I did, yeah. <laughs> so D1 is going to dominate and be logged as to the order D squared. Okay, but 
what happens if we do this instead, then even though epsilon has to be really small, okay, um, it doesn't get raised to another d. So if we use uh, Abishai's uh, improvement, okay, it's the same argument, but then our final k is going to be um, uh, log s to the order d. And maybe if we use this in addition, we could get a further improvement, but I, I, I don't know exactly what. Does this make sense? Okay, so I think the main part that I did really care, really quickly because this was, was like showing, was like, hand wavy was going through this. Should I go through that in more, more detail or just keep on going? Just declare victory. <laughs> okay. Um, I, perhaps you can say this, uh, what was the key uh, replacement that has happened in your, and you introduce this E and then there are a bunch of inequalities, but what is it that we cared about over through the process? Okay, so we'll, we'll try to like back up and say, okay, so, so there were these two complications. We had these two kinds of, of, um, of approximate, approximation. One, and we want to go from one to the other. Okay. So once we move from, so once we convert everything to a low degree polynomial, remove the Boolean functions and replace them by low degree polynomials, we can move from the uniform distribution to the pseudorandom, to the KYs independent distribution. But once we do that, we can't, um, we cannot claim any kind of numerical closeness of these approximating functions with the original. So we have to be pretty sure that there's some kind of way of bounding them that works input by input globally um, once we move into the, once we move into the uh, uh, pseudorandom distribution. So um, if, so like, so here we want it to be, so here, in this approximation, which wasn't true before, okay, um, we know, okay, when things are working uh, well, okay, when, um, so, so, I mean, is it on the right hand side? Is that what we care about? Sorry, so which, which? Tilda being between f and f with epsilon. Yeah. So, so we w because we want to because we want to uh, upper bound. You know, we're we're just shooting, saying that the the value on the ran uniform distribution isn't much bigger than the value on the k-wise independent distribution. We don't care if this function becomes like hugely negative on the k-wise independent distribution. What we care about is if it like suddenly became hugely positive. And by writing it as one minus a square, we're sure that whatever happens, it doesn't become hugely positive. Um, that, yeah. so does that make sense? There's a low degree polynomial, which is not never too much higher than than f. That's right. And it's never too much higher than f, and usually it's lower, because e only happens fairly rarely, even on the even on the pseudorandom distribution. Right. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so, okay. Uh, so maybe I'll just say like I have ten minutes left. Uh, I have 10 minutes left before I collapse. <laughs> <laughs> if he insists, it's a... Um, <laughs> so, why don't I, uh, you know, now I'll begin the second half of my talk. <laughs> um, so, okay, so what, let's, let's try to like say what we, we did here. Here, we like, took a lower bound proof and we used it to show that, um, to give like a positive characterization of what we could compute in the class and then use that to show what kind of distributions fool the, fool the, um, the other approach is to try to take a generic hard problem and use that to construct a distribution. Um, so let me just say what's, what's known uh, and give like one open problem that pretty much everyone already knows, but we should be working on anyway. Um, so the other half of the talk would talk about um, the Nissan Wigderson construction where you take a hard, you have a, a function, f, um, that is hard for some circuit model c, and it's kind of generic in that for every small c, uh, uh, the probability that c of x equals f of x is at most epsilon, uh, is at most a half plus epsilon. So you have this very uh, uh, hard on average problem, and you use that to directly com compute, a, a dis define a distribution. And the idea is that f of x looks like one bit of randomness given f. And so what we'll do, what we'll try to do is extend this to, uh, okay. well, we could say like, oh, well, given x1 through xk, f of x1 through f of xk look like k bits of randomness. Unfortunately, the ratio between how many bits we're using and how many bits we get out, you know, here we got, we use, we could like say, x is random, x f, x f of x looks like an additional random bit. The ratio hasn't changed. <laughs> and k random bits give us nk plus k. So this is true. Uh, so what they do instead is show how to construct from a single relatively small random string um, a sequence of, of xi's that are not independent because they're all generated in the same way, but look kind of computationally independent in that knowing f of x i doesn't help you much with figuring out what f of x j is. In fact, knowing any information about x i doesn't really tell you much about x, about any function on x j. So this is a very clever construction. Um, okay, the one, and uh, Nissan used this to show uh, a different, cons you know, pre pre um, Braverman construction of uh, a pseudorandom generator for AC0 because we know the parity function is such a hard function. Um, but this works, this, this hypothetical construction works for pretty much any circuit family, and for any circuit class. And if we have a, a large enough complexity class, then in fact, 
we can replace um, replace the hard on average with a worst case hardness. Why? So you think of a, the truth table for a worst case hard function as a message. Um, and we want to, to um, construct a hard on average problem. So what that means is we're constructing some other problem, say capital F, so that if we could even compute capital F with some epsilon advantage, then we could compute little f. Um, so um, what that amounts to is a kind of error correcting code. Saying, what well, you think of capital F as the code of little f, and then given even a very highly corrupted code word, we should be able to recover little f. Um, so what we want in terms of coding is we want a, a list decodable. Uh, because we're the, and the size of the list is going to correspond to the non-uniformity in the construction of the circuit of F from the, the circuit for Nodding along, but this is really his idea. <laughs> his way of looking at it. Don't you need it also to be a little bit local? Well, like that would be nice. There's a big problem, though. Uh, or at least oh, OK. A, a, a yes, the decoder has to be local. local. So it would be nice if also the encoder were local. <laughs> <laughs> There's a problem, though, in that no local <laughs> encoder can have a good distance. Uh, you can split it, though, into two parts. So if you split it into two parts, there's a part where you have to, you go from a worst case hard function to a somewhat hard function. Um, and that part can't be local. So this part is just sort of like a constant distance error correcting code or even like a polylog distance error correcting rate error correcting code. Um, but then from F bar, you can think of the XOR lemma or other versions of, of hardness amplifying as um, giving you what I'll call an approximately local list decodable code. Where the code is, so uh, I guess a locally computable and approximately local list decodable code. So let me say what the, the words are. The locally computable means that we can compute F you, any one bit of f using a black box for a bit of f bar. Local list decodable means that we can compute f bar using an oracle for f, for some version, sorry. I think I reversed that. <laughs> we can compute any one bit of f using an oracle for f bar. We can compute f bar using an oracle for f. Um, List means that actually we'll need some advice to distinguish. There, you know, there won't be a unique f bar for that f, so we'll need some advice or have a list of possible candidates. And approximate means actually we won't really be computing f. We'll be computing just some function that's relatively close to f. So close enough that if we compose it with the, deco the decoder here, we would actually reconstruct the function. Um, so, um, so using this machinery, uh, you can say generically, we can uh, take even worst case hardness assumptions and use them to de-randomize algorithms. Um, and I guess like the the uh, the strongest. 
uh, one of the strongest results along these lines is that if there exists a function in E where the size of f is not in 2 to the little o of n, then uh, p equals p. So, um, so presumably we could use a strong enough circuit lower bound to de-randomize pretty much any algorithm. Um, uh, okay, so, so the, the, the open problem is, uh, so we know this generic construction between hardness and randomness de-randomization, and uh, we successfully applied it to exactly one complexity class, <laughs> AC, AC0. So why don't we apply it to another complexity class? Uh, and the challenge is uh, the class has to be, uh, be limited enough that we actually have a lower bound unconditionally, but strong enough that, okay, either we have to get the lower bound for this very hard on average condition that where we can apply the nissan wigderson construction directly, or we need to get a lower bound for a class that's strong enough that we can do this kind of error correcting. And right now there is no class where we have both. So the main open problem is to take some class like AC with mod gates, um, AC0 with mod gates, and actually give a good pseudorandom generator for that class. Uh, the best way would be by proving a strong average case lower bound, but I would be happy for any other way in addition.